this morning's session. Um, uh, before we go any further, I would like to request one of us to please lead in prayer. Uh, Sitkenu, would you be able to lead us? Yes, ma'am. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. As we are going to learn about your word, Lord, Lord, it should not be wasted. It should not go in vain. But the learning we are getting at APC Bible School, Lord, it should be used mightily for your kingdom expansion, Lord, and your great works, Lord. Lord, let it let be as students and the teacher be used as a mighty vessel that is kept on the king's day, king's table, Lord, to enhance the beauty of the king's table, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sitkenu. Uh, so uh, once again, welcome to each one of you for being here on the mentoring call. As you know, what we do here is uh, we um, answer questions that uh, you know different ones of us may have. These questions can uh, pertain to the courses that we are studying right now, or it can be completely different, you know, something that uh, you have observed and are wondering about. So uh, you could go ahead and post your questions on the chat or even unmute your uh, mics and ask the questions uh, that way you know uh, our faculty is here they will be able to uh, answer those questions for us so uh, feel free you could uh, please go ahead and uh, ask your questions All right. So while we are um, waiting for questions to be posted, I just want to ask if there is something new, something interesting that uh, uh, we are learning. So if there's something new that anyone here is learning, uh, please feel free to share it uh, on, on this mentoring hour. It will be really uh, you know, inspiring for the others to hear from you. So anyone could be the faculty or it could even be the, the students. So if there's something new or something interesting that you're learning. Okay, <laughs> could I uh, like, you know, just request uh, one of us, uh, maybe Pastor Selena, is there anything new that you're uh, learning you want to share with us? Uh, good morning, Nancy. Good morning. Uh, and good morning, all of you. Uh, actually, I was, you know, just teaching uh, four subjects at, uh, at the APC Bible College and uh, you know, preparing for uh, four of them, Christology, Systematic Theology, uh, uh, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and uh, of course teaching even uh, children's ministry. Uh, you know, uh, I was just, uh, uh, I was just thinking that, you know, if I had learned all this in, when I was in Bible college, <laughs> it would have been, uh, it would have been so good. Uh, and I was just, thinking that our system in, uh, you know, when we studied in Bible college, the courses uh, had so many, uh, We of course, we studied a lot of things, but then it was so uh, kind of irrelevant to, uh, you know, really uh, uh, what we are going to teach and minister. We studied about different philosophies and all that, which is, it is good, it is helpful. But um, I was just thinking how much privileged uh, our Bible college students are, uh, to be learning uh, in depth uh, in each uh, field, in each um, book of the Bible, uh, even in theology, in so much in depth uh, about faith, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, and um, uh, the nature of God, 
uh, and all of those things. So uh, I just thinking how blessed they are and also how blessed I am because, you know, basically teaching all of these courses, uh, I myself am uh, learning uh, so much, uh, you know, uh, and I'm just uh, thankful to God that uh, for giving me this opportunity to learn once again uh, and also to be able to, uh, you know, through the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, minister to others. So it's a good opportunity. And also, I was just telling my class, they were so privileged to learn all of these things because I didn't really have the privilege of learning so many things, especially we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't study about the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, we uh, come from the traditional church where, you know, we were not even taught about the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the person in the work of the Holy Spirit and um, and also in Bible college uh, we did not uh, learn about the Holy Spirit so it's a good uh, thanking just thanking God for the opportunity uh, to learn yeah thank you thank you Pastor Selena thank you so much for sharing from your life and your experience you know uh, yeah it's so true that um, uh, this the is so much that the students are learning and even as faculty uh, as we are teaching them there's uh, so many new things that you know we uh, get to learn so praise god for uh, this experience praise god for apc bible college um uh, while we were uh, hearing from pastor selena uh Sitkinu has posted a question here on the chat for us so i uh, will take up that question so he says uh, ma'am when i read on something about abrahamic religion why uh, uh, they always portrayed in different way in the Bible. Adam and Eve had two sons, but in the uh, Quran, it is uh, written that Adam and Eve had two sons and two daughters. So, uh, like, what is the correct one? Please explain. Mm. Would uh, someone like to take this up? I think we recently had a question about uh, Adam and Eve and the you know number of children that they had. So, uh, any of our faculty? Oh, would you like to take this up, please? Uh, Pastor Jai Kumar, could I please request you to? Yeah, I was just looking at uh, the reference. Like, um, you know, in Genesis 4, we see um, uh, we read about Abel, Cain and Abel, and then we read about Seth um, in verse 25, Genesis 4, 25. And then uh, when we go to Genesis 5, we read about, um, um, you know, Genesis 5 and verse 4. Uh, we read about uh, the days of Adam where, you know, we read this in uh, verse 4. And he had sons and daughters. So, uh, well, Adam and Eve did have many other sons and daughters, um, you know, according according to the word of God itself. So, um, well, uh, and I think we can just go with that. Any other uh, reference point or any other scripture, uh, I mean, uh, any other worldview, uh, well, could be, uh, we know, you know, that might ha have errors in it. It could be factually right uh, on certain things. Um, but, you know, when we look at the word of God itself, Genesis 4 and Genesis 5, talks about the fact that Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. So I think we, we should just go with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for that. Uh, Sitkanu, I hope uh, that answers your question. Yes, ma'am, very much. I got a clarity, ma'am. All right, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so here again in uh, in the chat, uh, Elisha has a question. He asks, "Can a believer die from a curse of a deity?" So, can a believer die from the curse of a deity? That's his question. Uh, would any of our faculty like to address this? Uh, Nancy, I'll, I'll yeah, take yes, that yes, question. Yes, yes, please. And I'll, I'll try and, yeah, so I think, uh, Elisha, I just want to point you to uh, one verse that is in Galatians uh, 3.13, and uh, I'll just read that out for you. Um, uh, it's written, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a 
a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So uh, you know, through this we see that it is Christ who's purchased our freedom. He is the one who's redeemed us from the, from the curse of the law and anything to do with its condemnation. Uh, and how? It is because he himself became a curse for us by hanging on the tree. So as a believer, we, you are redeemed from, from every curse. Um, and so no a believer cannot die from the curse of a, of a deity. So that's, that's what, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that and open it to the rest. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, yes, thank you, Jean, for that. I think there's, uh, um, it, it's quite clear. Um, if any of the other faculty would like to add to it, uh, you could please do so. Um, I just wanted to add uh, yes, to what uh, Jean shared to say that, uh, you know, uh, the Bible also talks about different kinds of believers in the sense, um, you know, when we read Romans 8, I think we we see that a believer can be um, carnally minded and, um, you know, can be spiritually minded as well. So there, but then it says that um, um, uh, there is, uh, I'm just reading from Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. Um, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, uh, you know, the thing is, if I'm a believer and if I'm you know, intentionally walking in carnality, you know, there's uh, God will always, you know, God, uh, God will always reach out. God will always, um, you know, uh, to the uh, work of the spirit of God um, in us, convict us, draw us back to him. But if I choose to, you know, continue to walk in carnality, walk in, intentionally walk in sin, then I'm opening myself up to, you know, uh, the work of the evil one. And and we know that, uh, you know, and the, the assignment of the evil one, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. So um, to be a believer, we know that we have, you know, certain things in Christ, right? We, ha we have the weapons, we have the armor of God. Um, but as a believer, if I don't know how to use, if I don't know how to, you know, um, you know, walk in the the power of the Lord and, and, and the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, as we see in Ephesians six. Um, then, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I I open myself up intentionally if I'm walking in blatant sin. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor uh, Elisha. Just want to check with you if uh, your question was answered. Okay, sorry, uh, unable to hear you. Uh, hey, Elisha, there seems to be some issue there. Uh, if you could uh, please mute your... Okay, we saw your answer on the chat here. Thank you so much for that. All right, so we could continue. Uh, yes, let's move on. Uh, uh, John Paul has posted here. He says, uh, came across one individual during uh, Campus Elevate. This young boy is addicted and uh, wants to break free. I asked some time to talk in person, but he's not comfortable in meeting in person. Reason being, he doesn't have any friends uh, physically in all friends are through social media so he's not comfortable uh, in talking in person should we still consider chatting or push for in-person conversation uh, so jean would you like to address this question sure sure thank you, Pastor thank Nancy. you. yeah uh, john so um what what we do see i think what we see here one is that he uh, somehow has even opened up to you about his addiction and has desired uh, the need to break free. So that in itself, I think, is uh, an extremely positive sign. Uh, however, he wants to have some anonymity, which probably is understandable. Um, and also, there could be other, uh, probably some other underlying issues of uh, him meeting people in person. But if he, um, since he's chatted with you, I, I don't know how you got to know about his addiction, but nevertheless, I think um, he's given you a clue there that he would rather chat 
rather than meet in person. So I think it would be nice to gently uh, approach him and say that it's perfectly OK not to meet in person or meet in person when he is ready. And uh, you would like to engage him in whatever mode he may be comfortable in. Because if, if there is an opening, I think we can leverage that and uh, do it in the way that he seems most comfortable. And probably at a point of time, he may be more open for a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. I hope that helps, John. Um, yeah, uh, the thing is, you know, a little concerned about online um, messaging. Um, uh, so this person came to me after Campus Elevate and spoke to me on you know, face to face, and I took. He was willing to take, uh, you know, give his number also. And when I texted him, he he wanted to talk only in chat. So um, it, you know, long conversation. I was just wondering if it is okay to have uh, chat, with, uh, uh, not be comfortable with the uh, you know unknown person, uh, and also uh, from another point of view, saying uh, uh, you know how how it could. Uh, he could take it. I'm not very sure. I'm just a little confused. That's it. So that is the reason I was asking. Uh, but yeah, if uh, we don't have uh, an in-person opportunity, then maybe we can still go ahead with chatting. Also. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe, John, I think uh, you could probably ask if he would be okay for a, for a conversation rather than a meetup first. And uh, so that, you know, the conversation is a little bit more organic and more uh, you know there's there's a lot more that happens rather than a chat so i completely agree with that so you could probably ask that but yeah if that's not available then only the medium that is uh, that can help him to at least uh, share what he's going through maybe you know, the intervention also would probably be limited but nevertheless he knows that there is someone he can approach yeah sure sure yeah thank you thank you so much Thank you. Can I yes. just um, can I just yes. say something? Yes, um, uh, John, just just a little thing. Uh, sorry, a word of caution, uh, especially when you're doing things on chat, because I mean, well, at least uh, just some recent experiences where um, people engage on chat, then they take all your messages and they use it against you. You know, um, and there are all these kinds of people. So, uh, if I were you, I would just say, if you really need help, come and meet me. Otherwise, I'm not interested in chatting. If that person really needs help, see, you're making yourself available. You're in the same city. You're giving your time. He just has to come across and meet you if, he's, if he really wants help. Uh, I would be very cautious on engaging on chat these days, especially because uh, I'm just seeing that, you know, people record all those, you know, they have a copy of those messages and they turn around and they use it against you and they can twist and turn and anything. So I would be very careful. I would, my recommendation is don't try to avoid chatting with, especially with people you don't know. I mean, amongst us, you know, we can chat. There are all these new people and, uh, you know, we also have to be very careful with engaging with new people who come to church because of the atmosphere we're in. Uh, and I'm just thinking about, you know, um, the non-Christians, they can intentionally seed people into our congregations, uh, whether men or women, uh, and they come in, they pretend to be seekers, uh, and we are very naive, we start engaging with them, and then they use all of that to turn it around against us. So we have to be very careful, uh, you know, in all of these things. So I would suggest you make, you make yourself available and say, look, this is the way I will do it. If you don't want to do it, if you don't want to come, you know, I'm making myself available and giving you my time. But if you really want to help, get help, you come this way. Otherwise, if he says, no, I want to chat and all that, I would say be very careful because these days people turn around and use all these things against us, even though we are very, you know, very, we are sincere. But our sincerity often gets us into trouble when we don't operate with wisdom. So just... Take, a, take that as a caution and be very careful, especially given the environment in which we are operating these days. Yeah. Sure, boss. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Jean and uh, John, for that question. Um, we have uh, two questions here from Herbert. Uh, he asks the first one, 
he says uh, as the bible says man was created by god scientists say he came from apes and chimpanzee uh, could there be some people who came from the line of adam and others from the line of chimpanzee and apes so that is the first question that herbert has uh, and the second one he says god said let's create man in our own image whom was god talking to i think he would have said let me create man in my own image thanks so two questions here uh, we could take up the first question so i just want to request uh, any one of our faculty to address this please the first question um, where herbert says is it possible that some came from the line of uh, uh, adam and then you know some human beings they came from the line of chimpanzees and apes Uh, pastor would you uh, would you please be able to answer uh, herbert's question sorry i can't help but laugh a bit okay uh, so herbert man was created by god scientists to say um you know uh, when you when you when you think of it um why would we even need a parallel process um so why, why, why would we even need a parallel process to create human beings you know why would we even need that um and so so i mean the question is basically saying there there are two parallel processes through which human beings could have emerged one is the creative process and the other one is a evolutionary process so first obvious question is why would you need two processes right secondly uh the creative process takes place in an instant whereas the evolutionary process takes place over billions of years why would you need something like that you know so thirdly uh, the transition in the evolutionary process if you look at it it's never been proven it's never been proven it's a hypothesis it's a theory but it's never been proven right and if you look at it down to uh, you go down to the molecular level you go down to the the dna and uh, it's just 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 impossible right so uh, really the evolutionary process it's a uh, it's, it's it's a huge um a uh, theory or a hypothesis that's not been proven so you know i would just say that don't don't waste your time on it and uh, yeah so we we talked about it in our course on apologetics so you could refer to that you know when you when you uh, want to think about this whole evolutionary process is it legitimate is it valid could it be possible the second one is very simple uh, when god said let us create man he was just talking, referring to the trinity the father son the holy spirit right so that's the community that's that's the us the triune god father son holy spirit saying so he wasn't talking to anybody else he was talking to himself and uh, that's within the trinity is that okay uh, thank you pastor herbert i hope uh, your questions have been answered Okay yes so he says yes on the chat thank you herbert uh yeah, elisha has posted the next question here and he says uh, during the last two sunday service pastor ashish mentioned something about apc reaching out to the nations i want to know if there are any plans to reach africa so pastor i think it's directed um to you would you like to okay yeah and i said the answer is yes um you know that's part of our vision statement to uh, to be a voice to the nation and to the nations and of of course all all the nations in africa all are all are included uh we um, I, i'm just making a few statements here because you know, this is kind of a bible college i'm just to let you know that uh we are looking into how to do this uh, uh meaning uh, how do we help establish churches and ministries 
outside of India. That's been always a thought and a challenge. Uh, uh, and um, because, you know, practically uh, we have a limitation, meaning uh, our, um, from India, we're not allowed to send money outside to outside India. So what we will be doing is uh, we uh, we will set up something in the U.S. Um, called APC World Missions. So we've actually registered a new domain uh, called APC World Missions. And uh, the beautiful thing is just recently somebody's come forward to, uh, keep, you know, make a contribution of close to $100,000, 100,000 U.S. dollars towards our missions work all across India, uh, not India, outside India, missions work. So we will get that set up. And then from there, we will help and assist uh, churches. I mean, the, the work of doing ministry outside of India. So that's the plan. We're just uh, working on it. Um, uh, and, you know, once things are actually in place, nothing is in place right now other than a domain that's been registered. Uh, we have to incorporate in the U.S. Uh, money's already been committed. Uh, more money will come. And then from there, you know, we have to see how God leads us. What we have discussed, and I've discussed this with Pastor Nancy, I think, last year or year before last year. Yep. Uh, we will have a a process by which students who graduate from Bible college, just, just to give you a heads up, all this will be put in place, Nancy and I are discussing these things. Um, a, a, a process will be put in place where students who graduate from APC Bible College can submit their proposal of the work they want to do. Example, suppose uh, I'm a student uh, living in, you know, South Africa or whichever country in the world, doesn't matter. And I've graduated from APC Bible College, then I can, and I want to plant a church in my city or my country or whatever, I submit a proposal and we will review it. And a lot has to, a lot depends on our relationship with that student, you know. If, so uh, we observe the students over three years, as students study with us, we observe them. You know, we see how they are interacting and how they are, you know, we can get to know. So that's a big part of it. Then uh, from the proposal, and you will learn in your third year how to do this, how to, you know, when we talk about urban missions and all that, you will learn how to go about planning. So we will study that proposal. And then based on that, we will, you know, decide whom all we're going to help outside India. Within India, it's a little different. Uh, outside India, this is how we've been talking and discussing. And I think um, before this year ends, we should be getting all this together, Nancy knows that we have, uh, she's already written up some content. Uh, so we, we're going to put all this together so that we'll be ready. And then we will officially announce it. And then, uh, so that's the plan for doing work outside of India. And it's coming together. Uh, it will come together. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for um, providing clarity on that. And Elisha, I hope uh, uh, your question's been answered. If you're having any issues with the audio there, you could please type here on the chat. Yes, Pastor. Yes, my, my question yes, is answered. And um, I think um, I, we are all praying that um, whatever plans that APC and the Bible College has for uh, graduate students uh, to help spread the gospel across the nations, God will bless that plan and make it fruitful. You, you'll be you'll be ready to join when the the plan is set in motion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you so much, Elisha. Okay, um, uh, we have Herbert uh, who has posted something on the chat. I will read it for us. Uh, Okay, so he says, good brother Elisha, someone yesterday was asking me that you can see other pastors come from abroad and come to preach. When are your pastors coming? Indeed, the faculty try and pay us a visit. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Herbert. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how God leads us. Um, 
so thank you uh, so far for the questions, the comments, for the sharing that we had initially. So uh, if there are any more questions, uh, please continue to put them across. Our faculty is here to take them up. Right. Um, while we wait for uh, more questions, uh, we had Pastor Selena who shared with us you know, what she's learning, the new things that God is teaching her. So I want to open that uh, question up to uh, all of us. Anyone else also would like to share anything new that you're learning, uh, God is teaching you, you could please uh, share that with us. Okay, uh, Pastor Jai Kumar, uh, could I ask you? Yeah, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> no, just one quick point. Uh, you know, just uh, reading through Colossians and uh, and uh, you know when we uh, read through Ephesians, we see that um, um, that we are exhorted to be um, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. You now it just talks about the dunamis power of God, the the, the supernatural power of God that um, we have access to, and uh, to be strong in it. Really, uh, it's it's like God giving us permission and saying, you know, this is this is what is made available for you, and uh, and not just uh, you know taste it in a in little measure, but you know, I, I want you to be strong in it, and that's such an open invitation for everyone as believers to be strong in the, you know, in the in the Lord and in the power of His might, go beyond our natural strength and ability, which is which is really amazing. Uh, it's an invitation for all of us, so it's um, you know, it's it's something that we can embrace as, as our new identity, as new creations. And say, you know, this is what God wants for me, you know, and not to be averse to. Uh, the supernatural, not to be averse to the supernatural power of God, um, you know, because sometimes we see other, uh, you know, uh, maybe the abuse of it, maybe the, you know, and then we kind of pull away from that. Um, but the other thing that we see is also in Colossians that uh, when Paul prays a prayer, uh, so he says, same thing, strengthened with all might. In, I'm just reading Colossians 1 and verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. You know, uh, it, it goes in line with, um, with what Paul, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14 where he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Now here... Uh, the supernatural power of God, the dunamis power of God, uh, strengthening the believer to walk in patience and uh, and long song, long suffering with joy. And Ephesians, we see that you know the the power of God, uh, supernatural power of God, and that we are you know it, and it talks about the the battle, you know, the, the spiritual battle for which we are strengthened. So it's amazing, you know, that the supernatural power of God, both for character and for you know the works works of God. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much for sharing from your journey and uh, what you're learning, uh, you know, in your life. Uh, we praise and thank God for that. And it's really refreshing to uh, to learn this. Um, uh, Atisha, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. Did you have a question? Hi, everyone. Good morning. You're hi, fine. Hi, good morning. Um, um, Pastor Shri Kumar was finished. Um, Jay Kumar, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm, you asked the question about what is it to learning new. I am learning about balance because I've seen and personally experienced sometimes being burnt out when you're taking on too much and also involved in ministry and your family work. It's not like it's full-time ministry, you sit and even though full-time ministry, I've gotten a different concept of it. I mean, everyone is doing full-time ministry. We're supposed to be in God full-time, but meaning as a career, All right? So I am learning balance to schedule myself better, better time management because I was very poor at time management, you know. And um, I am learning that with the help of the Holy Spirit to better manage myself. So balance everything. 
And um, it's so funny that um, Pastor J. Kumar, he um, shared a collection scripture that is um, I was reflecting on that as well, you know. So I, I, I am learning that so, to sum it up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Taisha. Thank you so much for uh, sharing from your experiences and your learning. Uh, yeah, blessed to hear that. Uh, we continue to remain open for questions or even, okay, Sitkenu, Sitkenu, uh, please go ahead, Sitkenu. Ma'am, I have a question. Can you yes, don't mind? Please. Like the thing is, what I was thinking, like God, he's a mighty, like he's a, he's mighty. He created heavens and the earth. He has, he's so powerful. Then why he needs, like, a, like why he needs angel? Why he needs man? Like about what I was thinking, my question is that he knows the future, like what's going to happen, what is in the past, he knows everything about it. Then why God created man? Like man betrayed him, man betrayed him by eating the fruit. Then in the time of Noah, a flood came. And after that, and before that also, like Lucifer, he was one of the best angel. Then he also betrayed Jesus. He also betrayed the father. God is knowing everything. Like they, God is also knowing that this is going to happen. Then why God is creating that kind of a scenario? Like it, it is going to happen. Okay. Uh, yes, it can. We, uh, we could hear your question. I don't know if uh, you got interrupted in between. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yes, it can. Go on. Ma'am, what I'm trying to say is like God know everything. He knows everything what's going to happen in the future. Then why like he's creating the, like he created humans and he also knew when he created the humans, he know that these people will betray me. And when he created Lucifer, he like God knows everything what is going to happen in the future. And God might be also knowing that Lucifer is there. He will also betray me. Then why he created this, this beings and got betrayed? Then he's bringing the flood to teach them again. Okay. Yes, uh, Sitkenu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, got your question there. So uh, what Sitkenu is saying is that uh, God uh, has foreknowledge of the things that can go wrong and, you know, the the uh, creation that can betray him. And yet he, he chose to create them and then, uh, you know, work on their redemption. Why did God have to do this? So that uh, is his question. Um, would any of our faculty like to address this question, please? Uh, Pastor Paul, uh, any thoughts on this question? Yes, yeah, sure, Pastor Nancy. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'll just answer the first part of the question, why God created man. Uh, and we've been covering this in uh, the covenants uh, we were studying, that God is a God of relationships. Um, and even when we look at, uh, you know, uh, the reason he created man was because he wanted to have a re relationship, right? Uh, um, so I believe that there's a reason, yes, you know, God knows what's ahead. Uh, we also look at, you know, in the cross, you know, Christ crucified before the foundations of the world. It was uh, God knew uh, what, what are the things that are going to happen. But uh, uh, the wonderful thing is God gives us an opportunity uh, as, as human beings, as people. God gives us an opportunity to, you know, uh, 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 get involved in that relationship, meaning to, uh, join that relationship that he, the reason he created us was to worship him, to have a relationship with him. So he gives us that opportunity. Um, and as you said, you know, uh, because of the enemy, uh, there, there is this distancing between God and man. Uh, uh, but the answer to your question on, uh, you know, God already knows. So uh, I think maybe any other faculty can please take that up. But just uh, wanted to share that first portion of your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, would anyone else uh, like to add to what uh, he, Pastor Paul just shared? Um, just a little thought here. Yes, Pastor. So, um, so Sid Kinu, um, it just let's, you know, if you look at an example, suppose, um, uh, you know, just think about an athlete who wants to, 
win uh, I don't know, a long distance race, right? Like a, like a marathon, right? The athlete, his goal is he wants to win the marathon. But in order to achieve that goal, uh, he has to go through a lot of challenge challenges, meaning he has to practice so much. He has to tie, you know, he, he runs maybe, you know, 10, 20 kilometers in the morning, 10, 20 kilometers in the evening, every day, five days a week, six days a week. Uh, along the journey, he may get in, have injuries. He may have uh, different challenges, but he doesn't give up. He keeps, he, he goes through all of that for one reason. He wants to win the marathon. But the journey is not a simple journey. It's very intense, very hard. Yeah. So you can just imagine. Now, somebody looking at, the, at this athlete, they say, what's wrong with him? Why is he doing this? Why is he running 20 kilometers in the morning, 20 kilometers you know, in the evening, every day. Uh, he is going through so many injuries. He's going, why is he doing this? No, we may not understand, but inside his heart, he has a passion. His one passion is, I have to win the gold medal for, ma for the marathon. That's his passion. His heart is so passionate. He's willing to go through all of this hardship, or through all the injuries, he's willing to go through all of that because he's going after his this one goal. Now that's just a small example. So, what was the heart of what's in the father's heart? A family, uh, a community, right? That's his desire. So, he created angels, and angels are his, you know, messengers, and yeah. But he, he, he wanted something more than that. He wanted sons and daughters. So there are angels who are there assigned to do different things, and which is including worship and so on. And then there are another set of created beings so, um, with whom he can have family. So man was created for a different reason than angelic beings. So they're all created for a reason, but the reasonings, the reason behind all of this is different. So God knew, God knew that there is going to be all, there's going to be the fall, there's going to be, the, you know, um, uh, Lucifer is going to do this and man is going to do this and all of that. So there's going to be all these things happening in the journey, but God is after something and he's willing to go through this journey in order to achieve that. Is that okay? Does it make sense? Wow. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sitkanu, Pastor Paul, uh, also for sharing your insights. Um, so we have uh, about seven minutes left. I think we can accommodate uh, a question or two. If any uh, anyone else has questions, please feel free. Go ahead. You can ask them. Yes, uh, Deepak has uh, two questions here on the chat for us. He says, does the Bible tell specifically about what happens to a person who commits suicide? Uh, his second question, how to minister when we come across families of such a person? So they are related. So it's about, uh, you know, uh, whether the Bible has something to say about uh, a person, like what happens to a person who commits suicide, and then how do you minister to the family uh, of such a person? Um, again, uh, I leave it open to our faculty. Anyone could please pick it up and uh, answer Deepak's question. Okay, uh, I would like to request Jean. Uh, Jean, um, could you share yeah, your yeah, thoughts on um, this, please? Yeah. Um, Thank you. 
So I, I think I'll look at uh, question two and I'll leave question one maybe for pastor to answer. Um, now this is always a, a very difficult situation when families lose a person to suicide, um, uh, especially if they are believers, uh, because the question is about one taking on, taking off their own life, uh, giving up their own life when, uh, when it is evident that God is the one who gives life and uh, he is the one who takes away that life as well. Um, but ministering to families uh, is to minister in uh, complete love and no judgment um, and to just be in a place of support and comfort and strength. Um, we've had, yes, of course, families asking about, uh, about whether individuals who are believers who've committed suicide would reach would would go to heaven because they've taken on their own life. Um, it, it is at that time, you know, we our focus is more on uh, helping them see the love and the grace of God uh, through the hard situation, um, and to help these families come outside of the trauma and the and the very many questions that they have. Um, so. I, I personally have found that uh, a really difficult situation to handle, although I mean, I've never come across someone who's a believer who's committed suicide, but definitely those who have been unbelievers. But just uh, bearing their burden, sharing their pain um, alongside with them, not being seated in judgment for what has happened, but helping them through that trauma and that recovery and taking them through the grief that they feel, which you would do for anyone who is, uh, who is bereaved, uh, just being able to focus on, um, on the love of God and, and the sovereignty of God through, through those difficult situations. Yes, Nancy, I think I'll leave it open to someone else to answer the first question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Pastor, would you like to address uh, the first part of Deepak's question? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, Deepak, so the Bible doesn't specifically say anything about suicide in the, in the sense of somebody taking their own life. Uh, um, some people I've, I've heard, or I've yeah, I've heard some people use the scripture in Revelation twenty nine as though as though it was referring to uh, suicide, but it's not. Uh, they were they were using um, Revelation, sorry, Revelation twenty. I'm trying to look at that verse here, twenty one and um, verse eight, um, where it says, "But the cowardly." unbelieving, abominable, etc., you know, will not, they will not make, basically they'll end up in the lake of fire. So they, they use the word cowardly to refer to people who commit suicide, but that's not it, right? It's, it's, uh, we, we can't say that. And that's, 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 um, that's not conclusive. So uh, answer, to answer question, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about suicide, uh, uh, but what we, at least our position is that if a believer commits suicide, um, that person will still go to heaven uh, because, you know, the the person commits suicide just because, usually it's because of tremendous uh, emotional pressure. You know, people could be going through different life situations, financial loss, and this various things, which kind of pushes them over the edge. So even if that person's a believer, uh, they're going through something that really pushes them uh, to take this drastic step. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to lose their salvation, eternal salvation, just because they gave in to the pressure of that hopelessness or despair or whatever that emotional thing they were going through, uh, because we are saved by grace. Right? So anyway, so so does the Bible say anything about suicide? No. Uh, will a believer lose their salvation if they commit suicide? No, we don't. At least, I, I don't think so. I don't believe so. 
uh, I'm convinced that, uh, you know, uh, that, that God, they are saved to the uttermost just because they make that step. It doesn't mean they will lose their salvation. And so that becomes a point where we can encourage people, family members saying, okay, you know, that uh, for whatever reason they committed, they took the step, but we know where their spirit is. We know that they are with Jesus in heaven. Okay, I hope that helps. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Pastor. And thank you, uh, Deepak, for that question. I hope uh, you've uh, got your answers because we, uh, we've we uh, run out of time. We'll have to uh, close right right here. Uh, I'd like to request uh, with John Paul. John, could you please lead us uh, in prayer? And we uh, wrap up this morning's mentoring hour. Sure. Thank Father, you. we want to thank you for this time of learning. Thank you for all the questions that have been uh, uh, discussed today, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that we would continue to grow with you, uh, understanding what you want to speak to us, O oh God. We submit the rest of the class into your hands. We pray, O oh God, that we would walk with you. We would be able to listen to your voice, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for connecting on the call.